The year was 1924, and fur trapper Jess Sethington had decided to make his way up to the headwaters of the Yunuk River without the companionship of another person. People venturing into the isolated backcountry of Alaska have an unwritten rule, and that was to never go alone. But Jess didn't heed that advice. He was very experienced, after all, and his trip was not supposed to be long in duration. Jess didn't return when scheduled, and four of his woodsman friends began the tracking process. They located several of his campsites, and then all the signs of the trapper disappeared. About nine years later, gold miners and brothers Jack and Bruce Johnstone and their trusty dog Slasher had decided to trek to the productive headwaters of the Eunuch River. The labor of the day was exhausting yet rewarding, as the remote area was largely untapped and begrudgingly yielding its gold in exchange for sweat and blood. As the weary men finished up their dinner around the campfire, they heard a distant noise, a drawn-out noise, unlike anything the experienced outdoorsmen had ever heard. They knew the sounds of every animal in the wild, and this noise was definitely strange to them. Slasher's ears perked up, and he let out a low growl as he stared into the blackness beyond the light of the campfire. Their profiles glimmered in the fire glow as they listened and waited. Suddenly the deep moan was closer and more definite. It haunted the darkness of the woods and made their hair stand on end. The waiting and listening only added to the tension. The men checked the actions of their firearms and added more firewood to the campfire. The noise eventually waned, and the miners retired to salvage what sleep they could for the night. The next year, the brothers made the same treacherous journey and decided to explore an area called Sulfide Creek. In the canyon at the headwaters of the creek, the men observed a giant brown bear on the far side of the creek. Upon seeing the men, the bear made a straight line toward them. Jack immediately emptied his rifle into the charging Bruin, but the bear made it across the raging creek and lifted itself up onto the bank, despite an obviously broken back. Jack then pulled his sidearm and completely emptied the gun into the bear just before it slipped on the bank and tumbled into the raging current to be swept away. Upon returning downstream to their boat, the men found the oars, splintered, and their boat with a gaping hole in the hull. All of this damage was apparently done by a bear. The Johnstone brothers returned the next year and pitched a temporary camp in a flat area and started setting up their sleeping arrangements. In the middle of the night, Jack was awakened to see a giant dark shape silently approach him while he was in his sleeping bag. He slowly reached for his rifle, but Slasher flashed to their defense. The dog and bear hastily chased each other in the bush, surrounded by a cacophonous eruption of barking, growling, and gravel and bushes snapping. Later in the fall of the same year, the men investigated the river shore near the camp and found it strewn with partially consumed salmon carcasses and bear scat and tracks. The previous night, they were stirred from slumber by the now familiar and eerie groaning noises, which faded as the animal departed the area. The brothers went to examine a discovered quartz deposit near the camp. As they returned to camp, Slasher raced into the bushes immediately, behind where they had just spent a considerable amount of time examining the quartz deposit. They could not see the bear, but heard the growling and saw the bushes thrashing as the bear and Slasher confronted each other. Immediately following the incident, the familiar groaning started up once again as the bear was persuaded to leave. The brothers had to seriously consider the possibility that the bear had been silently lying in ambush for them to get within striking distance. The next summer, the brothers returned with their friend George and their reliable protector, Slasher. Bruce decided to quickly examine the quartz deposit again and left his rifle in the boat. While pushing his way through the tangled underbrush, Bruce heard a loud snort near the trail. The bear charged but remained in the dense cover, which was shaking in the footfalls of the giant man-killer. As the bear assessed how to kill the man, but remained protected by the foliage, he started the familiar and drawn-out groaning, so familiar now to the men. Armed only with a 410 pistol for protection, Bruce backed down the trail while alternately firing over the bushes and reloading the firearm. The charging bear stopped his charge temporarily, only to resume the charge with more anger and speed than before. Each time Bruce fired his pistol, the bear would pause its charge, giving him a few seconds to reload and fire again once the bear continued the pursuit. Each time the man fired over the bushes, the bear would cough and snort and then moan. This awkward pursuit continued until the pair reached the boat, anchored on the shore of the river. The bear always managed to keep enough cover between him and his prey to keep from being shot. Bruce finally dashed across the beach and grabbed his rifle. He spun around ready to dispatch his pursuer, but the bear remained concealed in the brush. 
For the next thirty minutes, the bear paced and stomped back and forth and groaned. They now knew the bear was trying to ambush them, and was not afraid of an armed man. Later in the fall of that same year, the brothers returned to the area and worked hard to complete a small cabin to shelter themselves. They fell a few cottonwoods and arranged them in a protective yet very preliminary foundation of a cabin. They kept the fire roaring, but the bear returned several times through the night and moaned that sorrowful and tortured regret each time. Slasher would chase him back into the bush, but the bear seemed to grow in boldness in a desperate escalation. The brothers continually held back using their firearms until they could get a certain kill shot, but the darkness provided the obscurity the bear needed. The last thing they wanted was a wounded and aggressive bear to deal with. The sun finally revealed a safer situation and the men immediately chugged their coffee and commenced working feverishly on their cabin. After making a satisfactory amount of progress, Bruce decided to stake out their mining claim to ward off competing miners. As he was carving out a stake from a small tree stump, Slasher growled and dashed past him in a blur of fur and teeth. Bruce quickly pivoted and was stunned by the sight of a gigantic, one-eyed bear. Bruce grabbed his rifle and fired from the hip. The bear was mere feet from the end of his rifle barrel, and the bullet found purchase in the bear's massive shoulder. Between the impact of the bullet and the kick of the rifle, the bear and the man were pushed out of the path of one another, and the bear blurred past Bruce. The massive blur of enraged bear piled up just past the man and let out a low and long groan. As the bear regained his feet and turned to charge again, Bruce fired and struck him in the neck. Again, the man-killer collapsed. Incredibly, the bear struggled to its feet again, and this time Bruce placed one of his few remaining bullets just behind the bear's ear, bringing its fury to an end. The bear lay dead at Bruce's feet. Bruce could not believe the size nor the condition of the bear. The deformed mass of the bear was frightening. Bruce observed that the giant bear had thick, leather-like skin with patches of fur and was deformed in its face. The bear was missing its right eye, which was grown over with scar tissue. Its snout was painfully twisted, with several of its mostly rotten teeth missing and infected. Realizing his lack of ammunition, Bruce called Slasher, and the pair returned to camp. The other two men in the mining camp returned to the carcass to stare in awe and wonder at the massive and deformed man-killer. They hacked its deformed head as well as its ten-inch wide paws from its carcass and departed to finish the season with a great amount of peace of mind. Back at camp, Bruce skinned the bear's head and the culmination of their experiences started to make sense. The bear's right eye socket had at some point prior been shattered by a bullet and healed over. Just above the right eye was another bullet that was in a state of healing as well. A third bullet had grazed the base of the bear's skull, the right jaw socket had been obliterated by at least one bullet, and the bones of the bear's jaw did not meet, nor had they healed. They remained infected and decaying as the bear lived on. Below the bear's jaw rested two thirty-three caliber bullets, and in the gristle of the jaw he discovered three thirty-eight caliber bullets from a pistol. The disappearance of Jeff Sethington flashed back to Bruce's mind, and he shuddered at the realization of the position the man had to be in to fire the bullets into the bear at that angle. The following year, the men returned to the location of the carcass and examined the bear's remains, now only bones. Bruce found that four of the bear's vertebrae had fused together into a single vertebrae just over eight inches in length. The giant bear's back had been broken, and the two adjoining ribs had grown together and fused with each other. Could this be the same bear that charged the brothers from across the creek and was washed downstream in the raging current?